Executive aces, and Borg is powerless, as would be anyone against this serving. A patient I took care of as a medical student happened to have been a very famous athlete, and I was involved in his care and making a diagnosis of him having had a heart attack. And he ultimately went on to have bypass surgery and then die of transfusion-related AIDS. And his name was Arthur Ashe. I was very lucky to have taken care of him and very saddened with what ultimately happened to him. But that, that was actually my introduction to this concept that, you know, this knee-jerk response to anemia that is often taught and practiced in many other institutions is probably not the right way to go. I had the responsibility of doing a young lady who had breast cancer. And in those days, we did radical mastectomies. And it was routine to give two bottles of blood to everyone. About a year later, she was readmitted, and I was stunned, horrified, I couldn't believe it. She returned with diffuse metastases, spread of the tumor throughout her body, and she died shortly there afterwards. That case registered in my brain. How could that happen? I couldn't understand it. Multiple times in my training, we would give somebody blood and we throw them into heart failure. It's, I mean, it, you'd have just the opposite effect that you think you, you would have. You, you think that you, by giving someone transfused blood, you'd be saving their heart, making, making their cardiac function better. It doesn't always work that way. The transfusion of blood is a medical procedure that reaches back as early as the 17th century. It has become a ubiquitous tool in the physician's toolbox, especially in the case of trauma and high-risk surgeries. While incremental advances have been made related to the manner in which transfusions are administered, much has remained the same. Throughout the 20th century, within the medical community, there seemed to be an almost tacit understanding that if it isn't broken, don't fix it. In this environment, uninformed thinking prevailed and the overuse of transfusions became standard practice. In my training uh, back at Montefiore, we didn't learn much about it at all. The routine thinking about transfusion was if patients were seriously anemic, we gave them blood. I would have to say that I learn probably very little about transfusion medicine. Almost nothing. Almost nothing. You know, we learn the basics in med school about transfusions and, and blood as a tissue, but really not much more than that. Any idea of transfusion was probably in my basic science courses, and that was very, very fundamental. It was felt that when someone came in with penetrating trauma, that you should start hanging blood right away. One of the things that I notice is, is that people will use blood transfusions as a tonic. I mean, if somebody hasn't eat well that day, they will give a blood transfusion. And I say, my God, that's a transplant. Sometimes we figured uh, mathematically, if, if the hemoglobin was below X, and the patient was supposed to get blood. 
And we were even told that if you're in the business of giving a transfused blood, we would never give just one unit, we'd always give two. That was the kind of rudimentary thinking that we had at that time. And we didn't have any, any idea of what was to come later. We had a legacy of do what I say and don't question it. That was prevalent in the 60s when I was in my training. If someone came in and said they don't want a blood transfusion, that left the professors and the chief residents and everything else with no plan. Because after all, you have to give a transfusion. We can't even consider something else, leaving the poor patient uh, vexed. But for a handful of doctors, following what was standard practice would soon give way to a search for science that would better inform their use of blood. Somewhere in the 80s, I was reading one of my surgical journals, and there are two articles in there by uh, a surgical group from Mount Sinai in New York. One of them pointed out that when you give transfusions to patients with colon cancer, the likelihood increases that they will develop recurrence. The other article was the same thing with regard to breast cancer. And I felt like banging my head. And I wish I had known that. I actually started getting involved in blood uh, at Norwalk. I was on the, what's called the Blood Utilization Committee at Norwalk. I guess over the months of going to these meetings uh, through osmosis, I recognized that people had no idea what they were doing. And then I started looking at my own practice and recognized I had no idea what I was doing and seemed to be able to recognize that this was a cultural care versus any science or any kind of a, an organized way of thinking about this. So when I got here, the fact that uh, uh, Herb Dardick was already starting to be concerned about this issue, the two of us got together and I think this sort of ignited some kind of a uh, interest in blood conservation, if you will. At the same time, a growing storm on the public health horizon forced an urgent reconsideration of traditional methods for the collection and storage of blood. You had the, the onset of things like AIDS and hepatitis C, which made us look at blood banking in a whole different way, and that really made us look at transfusions more critically. That's kind of what started it for me. Suddenly people became very nervous about that, forgetting mismatched blood, just getting infected blood. Uh, and that, of course, put the brake on, on it for, for a while. While the medical community was focused on screening techniques, an unexpected source would forever change the science of blood transfusions at Englewood Hospital. Jehovah's Witnesses. Known for refusing blood transfusions, this conservative religious group was underserved in the medical community, with many assuming they were religious fanatics. In the early 1990s, Jehovah's Witnesses began reaching out to the medical community with the goal of establishing a more positive and productive dialogue related to their beliefs. We were one of their visits, just like other hospitals. Um, they had already been to a couple hospitals in this geographical area here in Northern Jersey and had been outright rejected, literally had been escorted off the prop premises by um, one institution. However, at Englewood Hospital, a culture of humanitarianism already existed. The hospital had as a core belief the serving of all communities. And it was here that the community of Jehovah's Witnesses found a listening ear. 1993 comes along and I get a call from one of the administrators. There's going to be a meeting here in the hospital with uh, some leaders from the Jehovah Witnesses. And uh, could you make it down? And we were hearing stories of people coming into hospitals and people practically trying to sneak blood into people uh, in a hospital setting. And we were talking to them about starting a program here at Englewood Hospital. They also went over the human rights issues that patients uh, need access 
to clinical care no matter what their religious background was. Bottom line, at the end of it, uh, everyone asked, would you be interested individually, would we be? I think every one of us raised our hands to say yes. And the question was why? And obviously none of us were witnesses. And speaking for myself, I wasn't interested from the point of view, frankly, from the religious point of view. I knew that I did something that was, I wish I could have reversed on that young lady and unknown to me, maybe many others. I had no idea. So it just kind of fell into a pattern. I want to know what's going on here. I remember sitting in the office and saying, well, you know, we're already starting to do some of that and I have some literature already on this. And um, Major Spry and a few others who were with him came up to my office and basically cleaned out all of the shelves of all the books that we had because they wanted to see what it was and clearly that, that sort of started the literature of uh, Bloodless, if you will, at the time. That day, it, there was an endorsement of the program, and you had the buy-in of all these individuals, and it was, okay, what's preventing us? Let's go. But more than buy-in would be necessary. The path that the hospital was about to embark upon would take them outside of established standards of medical care. To that end, a robust program would need to be established to support the program. In 1994, Sherry Ozawa came on board and she developed the whole organization of it. I will tell you without any question about it, both Sherry Ozawa and Dr. Arya Shander were the two people, were it not for them, I'm not convinced that we would have risen to the heights of bloodless medicine that we are today. The challenge in getting the program started was really that there were no organized models to follow. The couple of hospitals that were already in existence were a few months older than we were. So um, it's hard to know what a program should look like, even though uh, the witness community was very interested in what the program could accomplish. They're not hospital consultants, so they didn't have a, a, a blueprint to say, this is what you do, these are the people you hire, this is the protocols you write. Mechanically, there was no issue. We, we could certainly do that. We took this on as a challenge, but we had to take a step backward. And the step was that we're still dealing with human beings, okay, regardless. And that what we're doing is unconventional. And we're doing things that are, we're in uncharted waters. And we were concerned that by just being enthusiastic, right, we may actually be crossing a line of human experimentation, right? All of a sudden we have subjects that are willing to get the care that we're giving, which is not standard. And therein lies the quandary. How could Englewood Hospital embark upon a course of care that on the one hand fully acknowledged a patient's rights, but at the same time deviated markedly from traditional medical standards the way forward required a thorough and thoughtful analysis of ethics, because only on an unshakable ethical and legal foundation could Englewood be confident that the program would, first, do no harm. At that point in time, um, I was part of the Bioethics Committee, so that to me is a moral imperative. Um, autonomy rights are number one from a bioethics perspective. So whether I agree with someone or not, uh, someone has the right not to accept certain kinds of treatments. We thought about how do you talk about the standard of care? Because right or wrong, the standard of care was not rewritten yet by Englewood Hospital's bloodless program. And somebody who's willing to die for their beliefs have to be taken seriously. And so this wasn't just a group of folks that came out with some idea. This was a people that lived their faith, and this was part of them living their faith. And what we're about in this country is to facilitate those things, but in a rational, scientific, legally defensible way. By the mid-1990s, a solid ethical and legal foundation was established. 
it was now time to build a viable clinical framework for the program. Success would require significant resources, a committed medical team, and an administration to manage it all. The administration of this type of care to be provided um, required uh, some structure. And the structure was bloodless medicine and surgery as a department, if you will. That department was modest by all definitions. However, if the program was to be more than a moderate success, it could not remain an offshoot. In fact, Englewood Hospital's desire to serve all communities practically demanded that the program expand beyond its original conceptions. So we did not want this program to be something that was sort of peripheral off on the side, this sort of community-based outreach program for this weird group of patients. This was something that was integrated throughout every part of the hospital, and as such, we needed to change the way we thought everywhere. Everybody who had clinical contact with a patient had certain preconceived notions that had to be uh, changed. However, as it's often said, old habits die hard. Thus, the founding members of the program began the formidable task of educating new members in a myriad of unfamiliar techniques and processes. And it wasn't just outdated techniques that were in need of change. Minds also needed to change. It was a, a slow process, and it was, as we always say in Englewood, slow, gentle pressure over time because it is challenging for anybody to change behavior, right, for all of us as humans, particularly physicians, and particularly if direction, they perceive direction coming from a nurse or someone else who's not a physician can be really, really hard for them to change the way they do things. Most surgeons grow up with this um, basically sense that I don't want to deal with anybody who won't take a transfusion to save their lives. We're all about saving lives. And so here's a, a people of faith whose faith tells them something different. And while conceptually surgeons are usually okay with a person's faith, but now when it gets into my operating room and has an impact on the outcome of the surgery, now I have real issues. You had people who, who were, uh, um, had been in medicine for a long time, and we were doing things entirely differently than they were trained. So that, they, you know, all of a sudden they were, we were asking them to open their eyes and see things differently. That's not always easy. Physicians were a combination of arrogant and foolish sometimes, so it's hard to get 34 doctors in one room and arrive into one single uh, decision. But uh, when people forget or, or their egos is starting the way, we have to remind them we are trying to do what is best for this patient. In my department, I would say that there was skepticism. There was no question about that. People have difficulty when they're trained to just uh, have one thing in mind, is that it's to save a life, okay? But in fact, what we're trying to do is let them know that Yes, we're taking one thing that you're used to, which is blood, away from you when you're caring for this particular patient. But we're gonna replace that with other things, including expansion of your knowledge. As that education continued, challenges presented themselves very early on that tested the commitment and capability of the fledgling program. I met my husband in 92. Uh, he's from South America, Colombia. We were actually fixed up by a friend and uh, we got married in 93, and then after being married for three years, that's when I was first pregnant with Jesse. I had a great pregnancy. We were even able to travel. We went to Italy when I was six months pregnant. We had a great time. I felt great. I was able to work until my 31st week. I said to Jorge, something isn't right. I think my water broke. So we called my doctor and he said, stop what you're doing, get in the car and drive to the hospital. As soon as they went to examine me, a burst of water just came out. I was scared, I said, that can't be because I'm only 31 weeks pregnant, it's too early. And then they had one of the doctors come in to speak with me to go over the procedure, what was going to happen after Jesse was born because he was a preemie. I may not be able to hold him immediately. They'd have to whisk him away. And then the doctor said that they would check his oxygen levels periodically to make sure that he had enough oxygen in his blood. 
And then he said to me, but don't worry, we can replace whatever blood we take out. And at that point, I just jumped out of bed and I said, no, I said, did you read our paperwork? We wouldn't accept a blood transfusion. And he said to me, exactly, he said, oh, come on, this is your firstborn child we're talking about. I was frightened, I was scared, I didn't know how to answer him, so I just asked him to leave the room. I felt that the hospital at the time was not fair with my wife. And my wife and I are one. And so, yes, they were discriminating against what I believed. I explained to Jorge what happened, and that's when he immediately called the hospital liaison committee, and they called Inglewood Hospital, explained the whole situation to them, and they immediately sent an ambulance to pick me up. They brought me in through the emergency room, and as soon as I got there, Dr. Sasan was there to greet me, and the first thing he said is, you're in good hands, we're going to take care of everything. They put my wife at ease the moment she walked in, and uh, when Dr. Sasan uh, greeted her, at, at that moment, you know that you are being properly cared for. When he was delivered, he didn't even need oxygen. He came out breathing fine. He was actually pink. And I got to hold him right after as well. They didn't have to whisk him away because they saw that he was breathing when he was born. And so they let me hold him for a little bit and I just felt relief. I think it was unique for myself and for Englewood Hospital because Jesse was the first premature baby born under the bloodless program that needed to go into the NICU and needed special care, but at the same time was cared for by the best doctors that we have in the bloodless program. So it was unique on both of our parts. But there were more challenges to come. Despite the program being on solid scientific and ethical footing, it had begun operation during a time period where legal liability issues were on a steep rise. The other thing, of course, and especially in the 80s and 90s, the medical legal issues were, were on fire. And surgeons say, good heavens, there's enough bombardment out there from the legal system. Why do we want to take another layer of at least theoretical liability? I can recall one physician who was very passionate at the beginning, he was somewhat skeptical. He was afraid that we wouldn't recognize a witness when they showed up in the emergency department. He said, how am I supposed to know that this is a witness? If I withhold using blood as a treatment modality, how can I be safe in doing that without being accused of malpractice? We knew we had to change the culture. There was no question about that. But it wasn't as if we were going to sort of get you a badge at the door. Our system mostly was patient by patient, physician by physician. And as we grew in acceptance, if you will, we basically used the anecdote of your patient. And it wasn't always a witness patient. At the completion of each medical case, the scientific method was used in that clinical hypotheses were tested and their effectiveness carefully evaluated. As the number of cases increased and the techniques were refined, viable science began to emerge. The question remained, though, whether surgeons would be willing to consistently utilize bloodless techniques or whether they would fall back on old habits. Dr. Shander, he carried the whip. If he found out for whatever reason that there were patients being transfused, these were questioned. And he would get the data together and these cases would be criticized. He was never afraid to tell people you're transfusing too much. Secondly, he's a scientist. And he's got, I think, one of the greatest scientific minds in the hospital. And he's conv his convictions are based on what he finds is fact. And it may make you feel bad sometimes because you don't agree with him, but after you open your eyes, I think you say, boy, this guy is really, this is one of the real driving forces here. Once you saw a lecture by Dr. Shander um, about transfusions and the complications, uh, you, you became converted pretty 
pretty quickly about the process and the complications and that you were literally transfusing an organ. With indisputable scientific evidence mounting on the effectiveness of bloodless medicine techniques, Englewood Hospital's doctors were now all in. As soon as they told me about the possibility of this program, I jumped with both feet on and said, number one, uh, we have to respect whatever are the, the decisions of anybody. And number two, maybe we can learn something about the proper use of blood products. And uh, then I became the director of the laboratory. And we realized, for instance, that we draw totally unnecessary amount of blood in patients to do blood tests. I have the feeling that a lot of the people who participated early on had some background, some understanding of what she was looking for. She was so, uh, when, it, when the call went out, I said, sign me up, please. It made sense, the program made sense. She had a rational program. She had an institution, a hospital, that was willing to take this on when most wouldn't have been. It was a, a vision. It was conceptually well thought out, but then it was also implemented beautifully. Because really, what's not to like about not losing blood? As bloodless medicine techniques were perfected and adopted, the next challenge would be to propagate the concept throughout the entire hospital. I said, okay, now how do we do this? I said, you know, I said, we have to really think about what we can do. There were a few things in place that were theoretically usable. We didn't pay much attention to them before. And they included the ability to have the blood in circulation with the blood that's inside, outside. And you had continuous perfusion, and also you saved the cells. The other thing is there were certain surgical techniques that immediately coagulated the small vessels, a scalpel that did it by itself. Another thing was that everything was done on time or ahead of time. So at first I said, look, you know, we have to treat every patient like an emergency. There was a huge education effort here at Englewood. I mean, it was everybody. We went from department to department with studies and stories and clinical examples of what we were doing and showing people that we're able to do this without endangering patients. And in fact, having better outcomes by not transfusing. By 1995, Englewood Hospital was well on its way to proving that blood conservation techniques were effective for the hospital's Jehovah's Witness patients. But that success brought rise to an unexpected question. Were the same methods beneficial for patients outside of the Jehovah's Witness community? I would say that seven out of 10 in my department were willing. I wouldn't say they were convinced, but they were willing. And the other three were sort of sitting on the, on the fence trying to figure out what to do, but we had a problem. We couldn't have a nine to five bloodless program. We had to have it 24 seven. So that raised the issue of what happens if somebody is not in the program and so we negotiated that, and uh, in the first year, there were uh, some negotiations going on, but we were lucky because in the first year of care, we had, we were, it was very successful. It was successful to the point that one of those who was on the fence got up at a year, at the end of the year of the meeting saying, this is wrong. Um, we're, we're seeing now that we could take care of all these patients for whom blood is not an option without giving them a drop of blood and they're, not, they're doing just as well, if not better than other patients, and we're treating all the other patients the old way. So we have two standards of care, which shouldn't be, we should have a single standard of care. It was a gift. At that juncture, it didn't just become about a right to refuse treatment. It became a much larger a much larger operation in the sense where we looked at what we would be able to do to help people in general, not so much people that were just refusing um, transfusions. It was how can we 
avoid transfusion in patients who may accept that. By 1996, Englewood Hospital was applying one standard of care to all patients admitted, with positive outcomes across the board. But outside of Englewood Hospital, skepticism within the larger medical community persisted, which gave rise to an additional question. How would the program be received by potential patients? There was such a void for those people who did not want to have transfusions. I don't think it's, it's just limited to people of faith, I mean, who are Jehovah's Witnesses. I think there are many other people who are averse to having transfusions that saw, here's a place where we can come and know we're going to get good care, but we're not going to be put in a situation where they're going to put, you know, a little addendum. If for some reason we need to, we'll, we'll do a transfusion. No, this was, you're not getting any blood product. And that was it number of, of organizations critically said, this is smoke and mirrors. This is imaginary. This is not real. This is not good medicine. And that attitude we heard at the outset, but the witness community didn't pay attention to that. They came. They saw a medical center that was willing to roll out the red carpet for them. Say, bring us your, your bad conditions and your physical ailments and we'll take care of you. And they viewed it as a place of safety to come to. With all my extensive years, four years of med school and seven years of residency and many years of practice at that point, almost a decade, um, there had never been an encounter, a meaningful encounter with a witness. All of a sudden, they were now everywhere in the hospital. So I was wondering, what will they be like what will they be like? And really, the bloodless part of this isn't so astonishing, because as I said, that's what we're dedicated to do. But the group of people turned out to be the most wonderful group of patients I've ever worked with. And as Englewood Hospital worked with more and more patients, something extraordinary began to occur. It was startling to me because I began to suddenly see my aneurysm cases, and I was doing an average of two a week, uh, my aneurysm cases suddenly, I wasn't even in blood. And I became really a better surgeon. I always thought I was great, but uh, as all surgeons do. But I became a better surgeon because of learning to make sure you don't lose blood. We took blood in little tiny tubes so you don't take too much. And we learned all these things as we were going along. Don't, you don't need to take the blood count, the red count, if the patient is not going to take blood. It doesn't matter. So you take the pulse, the blood pressure, the respiration, talk to the patient, see how they're functioning. That matters. And that, that's true for everybody, it turns out. They used to have rules. The, if a patient have a hemoglobin less than 10, need a transfusion before go to the OR. And then Dr. Shander would discuss it and they said, what do you mean, where did that rule came from? Who made the decision that 10 grams of hemoglobin are safe and 9.5 are not? We, what we achieved and what we were about all, all along is um, improved uh, methodology of using blood products. Um, the way we used to do it, turns out, was incorrect. It was prov provably incorrect. And we learned that here. So many physicians, well, not only physicians, people, they get in this box and they can't see outside the box. They don't think about innovation, right? And you need to do that. I mean, you have to just change with the times, right? And there are new things going on all the time with patients. Now, you don't have to be an early adopter necessarily, but when stuff's working, you have to do it, and this stuff works. There was enough public awareness where people started saying, hey, this is not about Jehovah's Witnesses, this is about bloodless surgery. This is about better outcomes. So now I want that. As Englewood Hospital's bloodless program began to take on more complex medical procedures, its success could be seen not just in the positive outcomes, but also in its growth. Watchtower began to refer neurosurgical patients, which are spine and brain, and the volume increased. The results kept 
being excellent and uh, it became a very large part of the practice here. Uh, and the patients came from all over. I remember incredibly complex cases. I remember a brain tumor from Louisiana that nobody wanted to deal with. And they involved our group in conferences. And I've spoken, I've flown to various Watchtower conferences uh, locally. I've, I've been to Puerto Rico giving lectures to the medical schools down there about bloodless neurosurgery. And it's been a, a terrific relationship. By the close of the 1990s, in less than a decade, bloodless medicine at Englewood Hospital had gone from a pilot program to a fully functioning, integrated program that was the standard of care for all patients. And most notably, a program with outcomes that equaled or surpassed traditional blood management techniques. And the efforts at Englewood Hospital on the road to these accomplishments had not gone unnoticed. At the same time, thanks to Englewood Hospital's foresight to fully integrate the program across all departments, the hospital now had a fully functioning, multidisciplinary team able to tackle complex cases with efficiency and confidence. When Colin was born, we knew that he probably had hemophilia A, and we knew that it would be severe because of my family's history. My mom had eight children. Out of the eight children, three of the boys were found to have hemophilia A, which is a clotting disorder. One bled to death many years ago, and they didn't know what hemophilia was. The other two had received clotting factor that was derived from whole blood, and they developed AIDS in the 80s, and they died from that. Even before I had Colin, I knew that there was a 50-50 chance that he would have hemophilia. When he was two, he started to have bleeds. And the one bleed that finally put us into getting a port in his chest, he bit his tongue. And immediately that took me back to my older brother. He bit his tongue. When Colin was seven years old, he developed scoliosis. Normally they start looking for that at around sixth grade, but he was younger because I have scoliosis. So they put him in a, a brace and we actually thought the brace was working. It got worse. Then when we found out that it was progressing very rapidly, we need another opinion. We had that information for about two weeks and then he was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And then he had a growth spurt and the scoliosis became much worse. If you see an x-ray of his curve, it's like looking underneath your kitchen sink. It goes like this and goes around and up like that. Everything was just so perfectly lined up to have everything that could possibly go wrong happen all at once. Within a few months, he was to the point where he needed surgery. We passed a lot of hospitals to go to Englewood Hospital. Um, because they, the majority of them don't have the bloodless medicine surgery departments. They don't have them. Or they have some form of them, but it falls apart at the end and they want to they give you blood anyway. The problem with these spine surgeries, these large scoliosis surgeries, is that they will lose blood during surgery. It comes with the territory. This was a little unique to several individuals here. It's not a routine case, but at the same time, we had a core group that preoperatively we met with and had everybody on board with what the plan was. When he was examining me, we talked about everything and he just said, mm, well, that's no problem. We'll, we'll work around that, it's no problem. But the work that went through, the phone calls they made, and the way they made us feel just so comfortable, it was just, oh, you can't describe it. This case went so smoothly, we did it at one sitting. And there was not significant blood loss, and uh, all of his medical issues were handled perfectly. He, he didn't turn it here. He did beautifully. He was up and walking around, I believe post-op uh, day number one, and uh, was to walk in the halls of the intensive care unit. The one outstanding feature of the bloodless medicine program was that although it was initially 
developed to help Jehovah's Witness patients, the principles we learned now apply to everybody. It actually benefited all patients. Teamwork across the hospital's departments made it possible to continue taking on complex procedures, such as cardiovascular surgeries, orthopedic surgeries, even neurosurgery. And with one success after another, the program would gradually expand beyond the Jehovah's Witness community. There are many patients in our community, they are bloodless and they are no witness. Because we explain to them what are the complications of, of receiving blood, and even if there are no theological reasons for them, but they realize, well, there are viral infections, there are actually autoimmune problems. So the, the evolution of, of the thinking was originally because of the Jehovah Witness, and I personally, I want to thank him for that. Having done so much of this kind of work over the years, I really don't even flinch uh, when I hear that a challenging case is coming, because quite frankly, that's how I treat all of my cases. It's, I think, the better way to go. And we were very pleased to see that it resulted in uh, heart attack outcomes at our hospital that were like top 10 in the country in terms of the chance of dying with a heart attack at Englewood two years in a row. We were well below uh, state and national uh, averages. So uh, that kind of thing has really paid off for us and has been very gratifying. So there's life-saving components to this that this has broadened out around the world and, you know, all over. I practice patient blood management um, truly because it makes me a better physician by doing so. And when I came in 2005, I really didn't have much knowledge about patient blood management or bloodless surgery. And over the course of the last 10 years, I've seen the program grow here to a point where I'm, I think I'm a very key point, you know, component of it, and uh, I'm really thrilled to be a part of it. So the bloodless program, I'm, I'm extraordinarily grateful to them, both personally and professionally. I honestly feel it's a gift that I've been given professionally that has made me a far better doctor than I otherwise would. They forced us to learn early what is now clearly the right medicine for everybody. Practicing bloodless medicine has made me uh, definitely a better surgeon. Much more attention to detail, uh, patients' labs beforehand, if they're anemic, treating the anemia. You can't afford to lose blood, so you have to get things right the first time and perfectly the right time. So it's made me um, really pay much more attention specifically to what I'm doing. When I started in 2000, it was typical for us to look for doctors who wanted to participate in our bloodless uh, program. Now they call us asking to be enrolled in our program. So that comes to show how much we have advanced in terms of uh, acceptance. The medical field acknowledges more than ever that uh, bloodless medicine is uh, better outcomes, uh, safer, and it's considered the way to go now in modern medicine. Although bloodless medical techniques had now been accepted by the mainstream medical community, smaller hospitals still faced challenges in the form of financial hurdles to implementing such programs, as well as lingering prejudices. My name is Michael Jones. Everybody calls me Mike. I live in Milford, Pennsylvania. My dad is uh, 77 years old. He's always been very active. Um, he's had a few health issues over the last couple of years, but um, generally very healthy. So in January, when he started to have some symptoms, it was unusual. We thought he was having a stroke, so we called the ambulance and rushed him to the hospital. It took a while for the diagnosis to actually come through. So it wasn't until about 11 o'clock at night when we got the word that it was not a stroke, it was actually his aortic aneurysm that they had been monitoring um, for a couple of years was actually starting to rupture. I needed to have an operation. And first thing I told him is no blood. The last words I heard is if he doesn't take a blood transfusion, he's going to die. Sharon called me the night they were heading up into uh, Binghamton to the hospital and said, Mike is really sick and he may not make it. Can you come up to the hospital? And I looked outside and it was the worst ice storm. I mean, it, there was no road. It was a sheet of ice. 
And as a family friend of the Joneses, I also read up on different things that can be done instead of blood transfusions. And I mentioned those things to the doctor as maybe alternatives. He's willing to take these. Would you be able to use that? And they just simply said, you're not a doctor. You don't know what you're talking about. He's going to die if he doesn't take a blood transfusion. We weren't finding anyone locally that would agree to do the surgery without blood and we were starting to feel that we didn't have a lot of options here. In the meantime, I had a call into Englewood Hospital and I got a call back from a coordinator there and she took all the information down like all the other hospitals did and then called me back and said, we'll, we'll take him. Dr. Klein called me and started to explain that he was willing to do the surgery. Then it became a question of how are we gonna get him down there and how fast can we get this to happen? and it ended up that um, they helicoptered my husband to Inglewood for emergency surgery. He suffered uh, what's considered a life-threatening cardiovascular emergency uh, that we call uh, a type A aortic dissection where a part of the aorta, the main artery that comes out of the heart and gives blood supply to the rest of your body, develops a tear, a sudden tear. We got to the hospital, it must have been three or four hours later, and the first words I heard, don't worry, Mike's okay. And that was a relief. He had a rather uh, uncomplicated, uh, beautiful post-operative course without any major issues and was discharged in a timely fashion. They're a lifesaver. They, they were very kind and considerate and uh, they didn't try to push you in one way or another. They just says, we can do it, no problem. They know where we stand, and they're very willing to cooperate and um, follow our wishes, and we really appreciate that. I would definitely recommend Englewood Hospital. They treat the whole person. They um, genuinely care about you, and we could not have gotten better treatment anywhere. The, from from the, the person in the cafeteria who asked how he was doing every day to the doctors and the staff and the nurses, everyone. They, they are really special. Well, if I had to do it over again, I'd go right back. I've got a friend there. <laughs> the hospital is my friend. Today, Englewood Hospital is the gold standard for bloodless medicine with several hundred physicians spanning a full range of specialties available to treat patients. Physicians come from around the world to learn the techniques here, and patients come from across continents to benefit from them. In many ways, Englewood Hospital is literally teaching the world, through conferences for medical professionals, through public seminars to educate healthcare consumers, in its generous support of nonprofit organizations established to advance bloodless medicine techniques, and by Englewood Hospital's alumni taking their wealth of knowledge to other medical facilities. Oh, I was absolutely very appreciative that was part of the Englewood experience. I mean, we learned, I learned so much from, from other physicians, from Sherry and so forth. And then when I moved to Michigan, I needed to continue that and create a blood management program here, not only in Kalamazoo, but also in Grand Rapids. Um, I've had the privilege of uh, speaking internationally at, at blood management conferences around the world, and that was extremely special. In 2011, I attended the uh, Bloodless Seminar at Englewood, and I, I learned the lessons that I needed to, to set up our program here at Johns Hopkins. The timing was perfect, because that's also when the Joint Commission held their overuse summit uh, and designated transfusion as one of the top five overused procedures in U.S. hospitals. So we are grateful for all the lessons learned from the Englewood experience, uh, not only from uh, attending their seminars, but also the publications that they've had in the literature have taught not only us, but the whole world. Now 25 years strong, 
The Bloodless program at Englewood Hospital continues to grow and innovate, always with the goal of the best possible outcomes. However, it's not just the patients' lives that have been positively affected. I've been able to do what I love to do, which is plastic surgery. We've been able to do it in a community here at Englewood Hospital that is collegial and academic in thought, but we have the, the atmosphere and culture of a community hospital, and there isn't anything better. It's just a great place to be, you know, as far, you know, as, far as, as part of this family. It's, it's been really very special, and I feel very lucky to have been able to participate and, and even contribute in some small way. These people who started this, trying to do things better, and it's kind of cool to be involved in that. <laughs> this place is amazing. The wealth of good doctors that are here, and good doctors that are concerned for the patient as a, a unit of care. We're, we're taking care of somebody. That's a, uh, a gift, in a way, and a responsibility. To know that the work that's been done here has touched so many lives, far beyond just the walls of the institution, to know that we've impacted the science, and that has benefited not just Jehovah's Witnesses around the world, but really all patients, without exaggerating, is a feeling that's hard to describe. It's just been a, it's been a, a privilege and a blessing to be able to be here all these years, to see it develop and continue strong. A quarter of a century later, just as strong as it started, if not stronger. Bloodless medicine and surgery. And so as the journey continues, Englewood Hospital will remain dedicated to and energized by its core operating principle, bringing the best possible medicine to every community and every patient. Thank you.